Hello, <laughs> this is Oazwo X Oazwo, Evil O, and today I am in New Delhi. And I'm with somebody that I really admire and really like, Annapurna Garamella. How are you? I'm really well, thank are you, you very so good? much. And I don't really know how to describe this space. I know it's an archive, but Annapurna, maybe you can tell a little bit about the space we're in. Well, thank you, Vaswo, for ha coming here and spending the time and getting to know. And thank you for, to your assistant, Ganpat, also for being here. Um, this is a library and an archive. So it's both. Um, it's called the Art Resources and Teaching Library. Um, it was started when I was a PhD student um, in doing my field work in Bangalore in uh, about 1999-2000 I started it uh, because it was uh, very difficult for me to understand where to get access to new research if I wasn't somebody important. Yes. Uh, new books and new research because doorways didn't just magically open because I came from somewhere else and I didn't speak, I wasn't a local person from Bangalore and I didn't speak uh, a sort of language of importance or anything like that. So I said, well, let me see what we can do. And I already had about 500 books that I'd bought over my career. Yeah, was this located in Bangalore? It was located time? in Bangalore. Okay. And um, then every year the collection started growing and Jackfruit Research and Design, which is the other organization I founded, uh, would do projects. And for each of those projects, there would be research required and we would buy books. And those books would then get donated to the library. So gradually, uh, we came to a position where the library buys books. Right now, um, galleries, artists, um, a few uh, individuals have donated books. But by and large, remarkably, this now approaching 15,000 plus, uh, 15, uh, thousand plus 15, publication plus. Wow. Um, uh, library archive is primarily purchased which I find really? astonishing. It's primarily purchased. purchased. And where do you get the funds for so purchasing? So we work, That's amazing we work, me. and sometimes we don't take salary or fees. Okay. We ask people to buy the books for us. Oh, okay. Because of various reasons. Maybe we have multiple projects going on with them and we don't immediately need the cash. Then a lot of stuff happens. Uh, they they want to, they want us to do a certain kind of research. And you said, well, you don't need to pay double taxes here. Just pay, buy the books and give it to us and donate it. Uh, or um, they buy it because um, they're good hearted. So this research library of art books mm. is open to any student from JNU or Jamia or whatever. Anyone. They, they can just come over. Anyone any can researcher. come over. And people from all over India write to Do us. Do they need to make an appointment or can they just show up at your door? Mm. Now, this is an issue that we okay. have which is we don't have a librarian full-time. Right. We used to have a full-time librarian, but um, this is an issue in India, and Falcanon, your friend, and I would like to go talk to him, the person from the Library of Congress in South Asia, is that librarians in India are by and large not specialists in a particular field. Right. So the specialist librarians tend to be more in the sciences. Okay. Or maybe in business schools, but in the arts, they're very often not specialist librarians. They might be specialist librarians if they're in vernacular languages. Okay. But in English, if we're looking at an English uh, 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 mix, we also have non-English language publications here in Sanskrit and Telugu and Hindi and whatnot. We have very few librarians who can traverse the diversity of things that make a very good research library for um, visual, built, and performing arts. So they have to be able to network, say, not just um, how to think about sound as a, as a quality that comes out of an instrument, but how does that sound sit inside a building? And then how does, if somebody wants to come and say, oh, it sits inside a building, how does that look inside a painting? So the librarian has to imagine with mm. the researcher that understanding of sound that this researcher is trying to... The librarian has to be knowledgeable enough that he or she can yes. direct. Yes, they, they need right. to, pardon the pun, but resonate the researcher's own 
research project a little bit, not right. not like a scholar, but as a person who can help the the orient the person. So right now it's me and okay. uh, my colleague. But you're not always here. So. And sometimes I'm not always here because I have my own research and work to do. So if people make an appointment, we try to make it open. And if uh, Is there like a website? How do people contact you huh, if they so want to make an appointment? They, they, we have an Instagram page. Okay, what's so it called? It's called um, Art Resources and Teaching. Art Resources and Teaching. Yeah, okay. it's, um, or maybe it's Art Resources Teaching. Uh, okay, yeah. it's Instagram. In, on okay. Instagram. And so they can direct message on They direct messages. And people often call us and make an appointment. Uh, we have 15,000 hard things, but we have many, many thousand more soft books. Soft article, soft meaning uh, digital. Books can and can digital you just off the top of your head, this is a hard one maybe, just name like three books in this archive that you think are really special. Maybe you can send me images later and I'll put them in the video. Okay, so I will do that. Um, I think some very special things that we have are Carl Kandalwala, the art historian and lawyer, very important person in formulating um, classicism and modernism in post-independence India, okay. a big fan of Amrita Shergil, a friend of Mulkraj Anand. When his library went up for sale after his death, we bought a chunk of his um, Rupkalas and Lalitkala Academy publications and other things, the Journal of the Asiatic Society, that he would have read and marked up and whatever, and on an installment plan from an auction uh, house that had sold to a bookseller in Bangalore. And over a year and a half, we were able to buy a large chunk of these publications. Those are really special okay. because we have very little idea in our country um, what a person who was a scholar or a collector was reading and looking at when they were thinking about how to shape an institution. So he was very important okay. in shaping institutions like the Prince of Wales Museum or... Um, so this is something very special. Very special, have. very, okay. very special. And name one other that's very special. Actually, these are, I, for me, special is um, we have some some very nice diaries uh, or notebooks from artists. Okay, now that's exciting. That is me. exciting. Yeah, so yeah. we have uh, from uh, 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 a uh, Chitrakar from West Bengal, a Xerox copy of his notebooks. We have Mulkraj Anand's own notes because when I was working on his book, I was allowed to Xerox those things. I've kept them very carefully, some of his notes. Um, we have uh, Manu Parekh. We have um, Bhaskar Kulkarni, uh, a, a very important Marathi artist um, who uh, was very crucial in the making of Madhubani painting Wow! as a field. Okay. Um, so we have a lot of these kinds of things. What I think we're really, really good for, really good for, is if you want to work on something, we have a lot of stuff here that allows you to really open up that question. So again, to use um, something like sound, as a, because that's on my mind right now, um, very few libraries will help you connect all these things together. But we have, and we are buying books that allow us to think about what makes sound in a mosque different from a church? What did church builders think about mosques when, and what the kind, way that sound worked in them right. and bring them into a church? How might um, temple builders have admired the way that sound traveled in a mosque and said, ooh, is there something we can do? How did mosque builders think about um, the way that sound was thought about by temple builders and, and do this? So all these kinds of things are really unique and we have a very large collection turning to you on miniature painting. Miniature painting. Miniature yes. painting. Miniature painting. I was going to go there in a second because you had also brought up Madhubani. Yes. And Annapurna is very, correct me, but I believe you're very, very keen on vernacular art. And full disclosure, but Annapurna was the author of our book, The Artful Life of our VJ. Very fortunate. Thank you very giving much. Giving a plug. 
it's a book about RVJ and I, and you decided to approach it from, I don't want to talk about myself too much, but you decide to approach it from the standpoint of the vernacular Indian artist, the bizarre painter working with the American. You inverted it from the way many people would have approached it, mm. which I thought was really smart. So what, um, what spurs this interest in the vernacular for you? And I also want to ask you a question, this is, goes with it, and that is when you gave the talk, the launch for the book in Mumbai, and you remember Nancy Adajanya, she grilled you on stage for a while about your use of the term vernacular as opposed to subaltern. Right. Do you want to explain the difference to, in your mind between subaltern and vernacular and then just go into your love of the vernacular? Yeah. I know that's a lot. But. That's okay. Let me okay. see if I can if okay. I can handle this in a graceful way. Okay. Uh, um, well, I don't love any of these words. Um, I went to uh, graduate school in 1991 at Columbia University. Gayatri Spivak had just joined, okay. and she had, of course, become, gained um, renown for her very important essay, "Can the Subaltern Speak." And um, she was very clear, but of course, um, every writer's words can travel in ways that they cannot control. Uh, that subaltern wasn't like a fixed thing, but that it would evolve over time and over context and over uh, gender and all these different things. And um, uh, I, was, I was fascinated by her, the example that she chose, which were these women that had committed sati and she was trying to figure out um, or there were satis who actually died on the funeral pyre. And she was trying to figure out, is there some way uh, to use them as, use these instances, not the women, but these instances of trying to recover their narratives that the colonial uh, authorities or um, later historians or maybe even family members to, to find a way to understand this situation. I'm putting it very crudely, but this is the way that I took it as a you know, young 26-year-old graduate student. Right. From that point onwards, um, I've, I have to really move back and forth from my own upbringing, which is coming from a rural Andhra Brahmin family, which is very patriarchal, loving in many, many ways, but very patriarchal, very caste-ridden, Mm. Um, very, uh, um, very complexly, not in some linear uh, way, you know, um, and trying to understand what that world was and how it made me, uh, without in any kind of uh, narcissistic way, but in a detached way, right? Right. Yeah, and um, and then coming to the United States at, at age eight and being confronted in 1975 with uh, Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon's impeachment and right. and uh, Jimmy Carter's um, election and this end of the hippie era and the rise of Ronald Reagan. All of these yeah, within yeah. six, seven years um, are a lot for a young person to process. And that process... Um, to me is about what big world events happen at the daily level of human life, right? And human experience. So that to me is a very interesting thing. So I could have easily gone into literature because I love words and I love books, but for some reason I really like the silences in visual art and in built art. Well, the alternative histories. Would you use that term at all? The alternative histories. Yes, the alternative ones that are languages. Not so, so recorded or alternative languages that mm -hmm. the visual and the and the vernacular medium, uh, sorry, the visual and the architectural medium represent. And in that, when you go to a place like Columbia for grad school, you know, you're drummed in like Rosalind Krauss was there and, um, you know, David Friedberg and really wonderful minds in some ways, but also hegemonic because their idea, uh, 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 whether they chose to become hegemonic or people made them hegemonic, that's something that we're going to have to negotiate for ourselves. But they were hegemonic, very supportive in some instances and uh, bewildered by the weirdness of India and yeah, South Asia, yeah, yeah, right? Course. Bewildered. Right. So in that space, then I didn't seem to me that asserting a counter hegemonic that that hegemonic was the answer for me, at least. For me, it was really important to think about what are all the little 
beauties and uglinesses and delightful languages and visual things and buildings. And those are the things that held me and they've held me all these well, years. Uh, you know, this is one thing I really like about you because even though you're different from me in some ways because you're very like grounded in postmodernism and postcolonial theory and all of that, but you're not dogmatic about it. You keep a very open mind that, to me. It's the vernacular. It's the vernacular. It's the vernacular. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. the vernacular. The vernacular is a bad word because, um, as lots of people would say, it uh, and would would point out that you know it's associated with um, a language that free slaves spoke. Uh, slaves spoke in um, in in ancient Rome, and. Of course, it has devolved in different ways, in different contexts. Architectural historians are very comfortable with the word vernacular. So what I like about architectural historians is they say that there's a space and a very important space to look at ordinary people's built environment. Right. The second thing that they're saying, which I really appreciate, is that vernacular is not just what you study, but how you study. Right. So for me, look, when I did that book with you and Rakesh, with you and Rakesh, was to um, was to really think about. Yes, Vasu is uh, very important to the narrative. He is asking me to write this book, but really, it would be really interesting if I chose to write this book in a way that emphasized the complexities of his life and his work in Udaipur. Which means that the way that I practice art history would be as if I was walking somewhat in the bazaar of Udaipur into the middle class household of Rakesh Vijay yeah. and into this funky studio setup that you have and try to understand how to think about this. That's why the book also has Hindi in it. Yes. And uh, to me, the great challenge and the great beauty of our work in the 21st century is to be able not to say matrubhasha, mother tongue, or native languages, or um, anglophone, or, or globalized languages, but to really struggle to find a way to make all these things come together, at least in brief moments. So, so do you avoid the word subaltern because it has more of a classist um, meaning to it and vernacular is not necessarily um, related to class? Or is it in your uh, mind? Yeah, it's totally related to class in is my it? mind. Is but it? I'm okay. ready to chuck the word vernacular. You are. If, if a better work comes along okay. that does the work, because time changes. But it's not subaltern. It's not subaltern. I have this little bit of, uh, not little bit, I think a profound uh, sense of wanting to avoid words which are overly used. Okay. Because when something is so overly used, no matter what work it does, it's it does it in very, it starts to do it in very routinized ways. Why does, you just said, why does the vernacular, why is it related to class? Because it's not related to class in the way that Americans think about class, which okay. is that, um, you know, some people have class and others don't, or right. class isn't something we talk about in America because we're a liberated, equal rights kind of country. Right. But I'm talking about class in the sense that the vernacular is there at all levels of society. So um, when somebody's composing in 17th or 18th century Tamil Nadu, beautiful kirtan, uh, they're thinking about, let's say, the Sanskrit Ramayana, uh, the Ramayana in Tamil, and maybe a Ramayana that's performed on the stage. And they might be thinking about something new that a Marathi-speaking king brought down from northern India and about Irish jigs that okay. were there on the coast, you know. Yeah. So all these things come together. And they're rubbing up against each other. They're they're entwining themselves, and something beautiful and interesting is emerging, and that's what makes this whole world exciting to me. So, when you think of the vernacular in India, I mean, are you talking about Madhubani, Gond, or just sort of give yeah. some examples of what you perceive yeah. as being vernacular? I guess. Yeah. So something that is ver that's such a great question. So something that's vernacular. Doesn't always is doesn't mean that it doesn't 
um, have the capacity to exercise enormous um, hegemonic power, right? So I've just finished writing an essay for um, Ravi Agarwal's magazine, okay. issue of um, MARG called Art and Ecology. Okay. And he asked me to write about um, painting and I said I'd be happy to write about Gon painting. Okay. Now Gon painting is what it's called on the market but as everyone should pay attention when Jatinder Jain or many of us are saying, it's made by Pardhan artists, right? Um, and the, the, the thrust of the article is that these, this art form emerged when Jangar Singh Sham was found in, made a connection with a group of researchers that J. Swaminathan had sent out into the countryside of Madhya Pradesh. And of course the story is so well known I don't need to say it, but then he travels to Bhopal and then he goes on to Japan and to Paris and to Australia, all these different uh, uh, art worlds. And then he dies. And he leaves this legacy of a beautiful visual language, which is completely new and invented. It's, he's using bits and pieces of things that he got from his own community, things he saw at the print studio in Bharat Bhavan or in other people's art forms. He made this wonderful mashup that only a great artist who's really creative and experiment can do. And, and made it, systemized it and codified it enough so that other people could pick it up. Yeah. Now that's a kind of pedagogy. Mm. Once it's a vernacular pedagogy, it's happening within his cousins and his, but it's a pedagogy nonetheless of some kind. It gets picked up and it gets picked up by the state of Madhya Pradesh, by the nation. It gets picked up by art galleries. It gets p picked up by auction houses. Over decades, if not, it didn't happen instantaneously. It gets picked up by publishing houses. Now, the the generation of artists that he taught are now approaching 50. They are being commissioned, like you would be commissioned, or Subodh Gupta, or um, you know, Mitu Sen, or any contemporary artist, anybody commissioned to do large projects for people with serious capital. Okay. Right. So now, what does it mean to call it vernacular? I probably would like to say now people are calling it contemporary tribal art. Yes, yes, yes. I heard that from Anabhav Nath. Yes. Contemporary tribal. tribal art. Right. And I have no, I'm not so interested in arguing for and against a term as really thinking about what does a term do? Okay. What does that it That term sounded pretty good to me because I interviewed Anabhav too and he had brought that up. Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to the reality of the situation. Right. It's now um, highly market oriented. But meanwhile, we're looking at a world around the little heritage village of Mandla that's being systematically destroyed. Those trees which are their ancestors are being uprooted. Okay. The, oh. the center of the stories of Gond narratives of, that Pradhan painters yeah, did it. Yeah, because the trees are such a major part of Gond art. Yeah. There's always a tree. And, and uh, Baju Sham, the artist who is the nephew of Jangar Singh Sham, uh, pointed this out to me. But these artists were pointing this out to me. Themselves are doing the commissions. Ah. Who are often patrons who own mining companies that do some of that work. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The, okay. the unbelievable ironies yes. of capital, the contradictions of it. Right. Art's relationship with capital is very it's complex. It's very complex. So it's very complex. class is all over this. Right. The class of the artist, the class of the patron, um, the class of uh, the class that the nation state aspires to. Right. Right. So all these things are there. Okay. I mean, this is getting long. Is there anything um, else you would like to touch on for a while? Well, I would like to say something about the library and its future. Please do. So I, um, this library now is getting bigger and bigger and it's going to become a research institute. Maybe that's the thing I have to contribute to the Indian art world. And if all things go well, it will find a home in a space where scholars can come and spend two to three months, maybe longer, to 
take their work and make it into publications or artworks or um, just a space to think very much. And thank you, Vasco, for making this possible. And thank okay. you. Okay, what's the name of the library again? Art Resources Teaching Library. Art Resources Teaching Library. Yes. Okay, I think we're running out of time. So I'm going to wrap this up. Anna Purna G. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. You're such a wonderful person. This is Waswa X Waswa Evil O speaking from New Delhi with Anna Purna Garamella. Please remember to like and subscribe. Keep these videos going. Share them if you can. Bye. Say goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.